I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed. We got Zach in the house. Yeah. Good to be Man, here. Man, this is, this is a treat, Zach. Normally we're zooming you in. You're like working on stuff, but now you yeah. got to just like right here. Just down here on vacation. <laughs> he's come back from Florida licking his wounds. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> I think he's actually in... Uh, where you at now, North Carolina? North Carolina, but I am licking my wounds after after last night. That was not. So I decided to wear a little bit of purple and gold just to welcome Zach back to Louisiana because he knows this is the land of the tigers. And and it, by the time this airs, it will have been a few days, but uh, most of you will have known that LSU won the national championship, and they happen to beat the Florida Gators, who Zach and his family are big fans of. We are. I actually had uh, Gordo, uh, Gordon, Zach's dad was at my house and uh you know and look Florida had beaten LSU 24 to 4 in the second game of this series and so Gordon's riding pretty high he's coming in he's confident and I'm fully I'm like okay you're confident but he did say one thing he said I kind of wish we wouldn't have beat them so bad cuz that may have been just too much yeah and but then they started out ahead and then it was like then it just flipped and turned around kind of the same way so I don't well, know Well I think it was uh Skip Bertman, who said sometimes there has to be a sacrifice to the baseball gods. <laughs> and that's, He wasn't an idolater. He just made, you know, it's kind of a Well, you sacrificed tip. your top-tier pitching to win the series. You know, it's best two out of three. You give away a game once you realize you're well, out. Once you're so far down. It's like, why put in? Right. Yeah. LSU pitched a lot of young guys. And, and look, Florida just teed off. Look, them. I don't want to. You know, rub it in or anything. I'm not that kind of guy. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. None no. of the family really is that. Yeah, you I guys mean, are. We, there's no experience be, uh, of anybody uh, rubbing it in. Never on. roasted me. No, <laughs> that I, never happens. Can I finish? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but well, welcome, Ross. Pro I don't want to. Wanna, I don't want to rub it in. <laughs> but we beat y'all two out of three, mm-hmm. and we didn't even pitch our best pitcher, who is a once in a what. 30 year generation or lifetime. Yeah. For I mean, this guy. So just let that soak in for just a moment. <laughs> I appreciate that. Jace. So, uh, what we did was we did a psychological war plan against Florida because, you know, he had pitched just to get here. Cause we were in the losers bracket because, mm-hmm. you know, we had to play the number one C, which was wake Forest, And look, they're good. They, oh, Fantastic. I mean, it was amazing to beat them because those games were like unfun- – they were just unbelievable and phenomenal. Oh, they were. So we, we used up, you know, skeins just, just to get there. So – but I thought to myself, if we just get the lead, because it was like Willie pitch on three days rest and there was all this drama. But that, I think that was all a psychological plan by LSU because once we got the lead, I don't know, it's fourth or fifth inning – they were like, Paul, go walk to the bullpen with all your bags and all your warm up tools. Because the camera had been on him all night, you know, so everybody's. And the watching. crowd started rising up. Of course, we're ahead at this time. And yeah. he's walking right in front of the Florida dugout. And then he goes down there and starts doing some stretching. And so you're like, what's the message there? The message is if you think you're going to come back, <laughs> the backstop is here. That's not going to happen. That's, yeah. It's. Over and it just got worse and yeah. worse. And then he got to the ninth, and you looked up, and he was back in the dugout. They're yeah, like, oh, hugging. "Come on, back!" Everybody's hugging, and yeah, yeah it's like, I've it's always, a- I've always said, Florida's a football school, anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, except for the last podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and you are, yeah. To be fair, you are rubbing it in, and you've trained your your grandkids to do that because apparently your ten year old grand. I heard about this that your grandchild, yeah, your grandson. Ran my dad out of the house last night. My oldest grandson is named after me, and that turned out to be prophetic because we've always been pretty good at at trash talk. And so Gordo comes in. Of course, Gordon is the kind of person he encourages this stuff, you know, constantly. To be fair, he does. He does. And so he 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 started in with Corby early, and of course, once the game started going the way it went. My grandson rose up, <laughs> and finally, Gordon, about the eighth inning, he said, well, I'm going to pack and going to bed. <laughs> I've had enough. Around. I'm heading back to North Carolina, so uh, it was fun. Well, what's so funny, when I look back on this, because I, I have a, a few friends in Omaha, and I was trying to get there. 
yeah. at, at multiple <laughs> occasions. <laughs> I, there was literally not a window because y'all kept planning stuff. We were very busy. <laughs> uh, <but laughs> Which yeah. is why Zach is here. Yeah, I'm here. We did the family premiere. I, I was actually, we were going to take a break from the show, but the yeah. last show we filmed, I was in Maryland. And so I'm having to watch LSU every night in some way that was weird. And then I was, you know, embarrassing myself because I got so caught up in the game. So like when we were playing Tennessee, I got my earphones on. I'm watching it on my phone in the Atlanta airport. And uh, it was, when Dylan Cruz, he hit a home run like in the eighth or ninth inning, right. opposite field, yep. curveball. And which, by the way, just what a what a fantastic play. We were talking about skeins. Yeah. You know, and I love Cruz because, you know, they interviewed his, his yeah. parents and he, they just seemed like a humble family. Didn't you and, think his dad looked like every welder I know in West Monroe? He looked yeah. like he had a welding machine on the back of his yeah. truck. He was just the most normal looking person and he was in his interviews were funny. well it was so funny because they were like well congratulations because dylan cruz won the golden spikes award which is the college baseball's best player which i mean i thought him and skeen should have been like yeah co uh, yeah. how does skeen's not win it but right. anyway they they told his parents congratulations and he was like for what <laughs> like, well your son you know and it's like <laughs> this is a team game you know we're trying to win a national championship here I mean, which i love that response yeah. it was just like this is that that doesn't fit into my equ equation but so i'm in the atlanta airport and you get lost when you have earphones on he hits that home run well i responded the way I'm, you would I'm a yeller the way you would in your living room i'm a holler <laughs> i'm fist pumping it's loud in my ears, and then I looked up and realized <laughs> that I have shut down the Atlanta. <laughs> You're in a Everybody <laughs> is in stunned silence <laughs> looking at me, yeah. and I was like. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't well, get it. You should have said. They had no you idea. You should have said, that you should have unashamed podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So then I make it to Maryland, we film, so then here we go again. It was the first night we're playing Florida. My schedule, the when we got, we filmed 12 hours, I got to the hotel, which we usually stay at a house somewhere, but we were at a hotel. I uh, took a shower, got found the game well, on TV, which was awesome. It starts, and that was that game, uh, the first game against Florida. Which Extra was innings. Nail. Oh, it was, yeah, nail it was a nail butter. Yeah, it was. So the home run goes off. We take the lead. Well, I just went absolutely nuts in the hotel room. I was by myself. Uh, yeah. You know, it's not five minutes later, which I forgot what all I did, but I just, I just went nuts. It was like, <laughs> I'm like, who in the world would be knocking them on my door? And they're like, is there a problem? <laughs> you got noise complaint on you. <laughs> noise complaint. Yeah. Someone in pain <laughs> or needing help. I was like, no, I'm trying to watch LSU. <laughs> well, we, I got a noise complaint too. We watched it at Al's house or his son-in-law's house. And there's like so they have kind of a compound setting. A compound and setting. And I had let everybody know no one, no dashers are invited to my house. Oh yeah, how's that out first there. game? Yeah, I was back there. I just y'all didn't know it. I was watching it in my own privacy. You, you were never in your place. I was at my house. Yeah. yeah, I was nowhere to be seen. But Jay, I wasn't a part of the group. No, but Jay, it's I mean it's Jay's house. Yeah. He lives there, and we're watching a game. And when something good happens, you, you what do you do? You clap. We were not we weren't excessive at all. But it, I mean, he was like the whole time he's out there going, dashers are so annoying. I mean, he's just sitting there the whole like, you clap and he gets mad. Well, so, he's an angry fan. And, he's, he, and he, he said he quit watching ball. So why was he? He did not, he did not enjoy the experience. Of course, Zach, of, to be fair, you ruined Stone. You came to our house, my house, my other house before this, and we were watching an Auburn LSU football game. So Zach comes in, he's having dinner with us. Wearing Auburn gear. <laughs> He's not even an Auburn fan. He just came in to, like, cause a scene. I, I came to troll. And he, <laughs> he said by halftime, Jay went home. He he just – he got so mad, he was either going to fight Zach or go home. That has been, like, 20 years ago. But right? he doesn't forget. <laughs> he does That's the deal. You've forgotten that. 
<laughs> so, he didn't enjoy it though. So anyway, no, it was congrats, fun. congrats to the Tigers. Yeah, congrats. And thanks for allowing us to to gloat a little bit about it. So Zach, the reason you're here, other than us watching baseball together, was for the family screening, I guess you'd call yeah. it. Yeah, for the blind. So tell us about that because that was amazing. We had a it was way more than family. We had a, a packed theater. Why uh, were we watching that? Why? Yeah. Because the, no, they hadn't seen it yet. You were the only one that had watched the film. Yeah, and it's, it's now yeah. and it's now basically finished. Yeah, return. it's it's. it's yeah, I'd watched a rough cut. Yeah, we're ninety. Right. We're ninety. So we're in the theater. It's on the big screen. Yeah. I mean, it's a big deal. And I had not seen it before. Neither had Dad. And so we saw it for the first time, which we'll talk about our reaction. But just talk about putting it on because it was oh. it was quite the production just to put this on and invite people. And yeah, it was it was a lot of work. I mean, it, I was nervous about it just because you know it's, you, you hadn't know, seen you hadn't seen it yet. So if you ought to been like, what if we said? <laughs> I'm like, this I don't is know. Terrible. <laughs> we're, we're, we're already in now, guys. So I don't know how to pull it back. Well, Jason had already given it some some good kudos. So. Yeah, I want. Yeah, Jace gave me. Uh, you got you got to watch the film, and and I will tell you that I want to. I don't want to tell you what yet but you but there is a, a something at the end of the film that is very special that i will have to say was jace's idea i'm gonna give you credit because that was your idea and it turned out like it, like it's it was fantastic yeah i don't want to say what it is yet no. because we can't no, but you gotta let it, people yeah. discover that. well i would say that i got the idea from the lord because i was just i was thinking we want we want no matter what venture we're involved in, we don't say this just as cliche, but your our number one goal is to give credit where credit is due, which is the Lord. Yes, I right. Mean, that, he's the one yeah. driving this train. Well, it was really interesting because obviously it's my first time to see it, so now I can comment just on my experience of seeing it. And uh, I, I thought one of the most interesting thing was, and I would say this is a theme to add throughout, I'm sitting next to a guy that was – converted to Christ through mainly Jace's ministry, but then all of us, because we discipled and did a lot of follow-up. So this is part of your list, Jace. The guy I was sitting next to was part of your list you've mentioned on here before, the friends you had. You Who wanted. was it? Philip. Okay. Oh, when I was in high school. Yeah, when you were in high school. Yeah. So this he is, actually came to me after, but go ahead. Yeah, so Philip is sitting next to me. And, of course, I'm emotional. You know, first I thought it was just some kind of allergy in the air, but I realized it was just it was a very emotional movie. And so, you know, I'm crying in different parts of the movie. But I look over and Philip is just, I mean, tears are streaming. Mm-hmm. So afterwards I asked him, I was like, so, so, I mean, like I understood me crying because I was in it. You know, I was in the movie. I said, so why, why were you so emotional? And he was like, because if God had never changed, you know, Phil and Kay, I would have never found Jesus. Wow. You know, and so he viewed the film as, you know, degrees of separation from the gospel message going out to people. And so, I mean, he was in, is cried as much as I did. And he so, said to me after it was over, he come up, he was emotional. He hugged me. He said, the whole time I was thinking, I hope he makes it. <laughs> I hope he makes it. Because if he doesn't, I may disappear. Yeah. <laughs> it's like one of those time travel. Like back to the future. Back to yeah. the future. Like, oh, yeah. look, I'm disappearing. I, my right arm <laughs> is disappearing. Come on, Phil. <laughs> oh, wow. Hang in there, Dad. I think that was cool when you're sitting there. When I was looking at the audience and I addressed the, kind of the whole audience, which was primarily made up of family and, and close friends that have... I would say part of the downline ministry of, of you and Kay and my mom was part of it too. So I think that was, there was a moment there where I'm looking at that kind of our, our, our family, our church family that even though we all go to different churches now, some of us do, but that, that, that and, and not everybody was there. I mean, there were a, yeah. a lot of other people. I mean, that, we only fit 220 people in there, but I mean, there's a lot of people just that I know about that I'm close with that are part of that. Their stories are connected down the line from this and i think about like phil to jace or really my mom to phil to jace yeah. and back to me and you know yeah. philip and right yeah we yeah it's, it was you start thinking about the impact of how god's ripple effect works and how his kingdom works is a uh, powerful let me take a break I do want to say uh, about Philip, though, it, and it was because it's an unusual conversion. Most times, you know, you have a relationship with someone, or yeah. you know, it's kind of how. By I, the way, those the fans, you, he's he was on the show. He was McMillan, the villain, on the show, and he sized right hand man. So. Well, he, and he's he, on the Duck Call Empire. He's on the Duck Call, well, and he's on our our new show. 
Uh, oh, that's it? right. I forgot. He, yeah. Well, he 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 will be right at some point. Yeah, yeah he okay. comes along, but pick him up. <laughs> but we, uh, I just wanted to share because when you realize where the power is, it's not in us. It's you know, I mean, technically, it's in us through the Spirit of the Lord. But he was not even, you know, a target. I mean, he was on the list, but he was on the list because my best friend in high school who was the first person who responded from the list that I had made, we were going to study with another guy. And uh, on the way, he recognized Philip's car and said, hey, let's go pull over. Pull. I mean, the guy, Philip was just in the parking lot, like assessing. Who, who, who was, the, who was the, the first one? Blake. Okay. Blake Gaston. Okay. And, uh, so he said, pull over. And so I was like, okay. And so he we pulled up and it was Phil. He had a little black, uh, like a Trans Am, like sports car. Look oh, at yeah. this. It looked amazing. So he's sitting there pondering his next move, which was not, you know, it wasn't a good move. No. <laughs> and so uh, Blake said, "Hey, we're going. We're going over here to play some cards and hang out." Which I was thinking, I guess it's okay to tell a white lie. <laughs> If it's <laughs> it wasn't the full <laughs> truth, yeah, yeah. I was, I was like, Are we playing? I thought we were going to have a Bible study, and uh, so he's like, You want to you wanna come? It's gonna be fun. He's like, Yeah, he's and so then to Blake's credit, he said, Oh, and, and there might be a little Bible study, and he said, Well, no, I don't know about that. And he's like, Well, we won't, we, you know, we're, it's not like we're gonna sit you down and single you out. And so uh, he said, sure. So he followed us over there. So we got in there. So I said, come over here and sit down next to this other fella. I mean, I did the exact opposite. So you did say, was it going to happen? I said, sit down right here and listen. And so the original guy we shared with didn't respond at that time. He did later. But, uh, and Philip did, which was, I mean, just random side of the road, picked up the hitchhiker pretty much, went over, shared Jesus. And he, that was, how many years ago? It's been uh, over, it's been over 30 because. Over 30 years ago, yeah. and he never, I mean, he just never left. The trajectory has been up. He and Alicia, his wife, um, were were dating at that time, and they were the second wedding that I did, because that was kind of our track. We, these people were being converted, and then they were getting married, yeah. and then we were marrying them and discipling them, and so it was really interesting. And so Blake and Philip now passed their 30. You know, and his wife, uh, girlfriend at the time, you know, I shared with her because that's how the, uh, that's how the gospel spreads. And uh, she didn't say a whole lot. And a few days later, she knocked on our door in the pouring down rain. It was like six o'clock in the morning. And she was just tears flowing down her, down her face. And she's like, can't get around it. Yeah. And she's a and so, she's what a, a solid and yeah, she's what a, a solid woman. So sitting, so Philip was sitting next to me, and Alicia, and then sitting right behind me, literally in the seat above me, was were Mac and Mary. And Mac was on our podcast recently. Mac Owen, you know, he's in charge of all the celebrate recoveries, yeah. you know, on the in, on this hemisphere. And Mac was another dad that, and he was tearful after, and he and I talked, and he was like, you know, I was part of this tree yeah, yeah. of people that once discipled, then made an impact. And so I told Mac, I said, you know, one of the things the movie reminded me of is I feel like the first few thousand years of eternity is just going to be following the fruit of the gospel. You know, people that you couldn't imagine you impacted. So much of it you won't even know until you get where you can see the whole picture. And so I just thought that's what I got out of this whole idea of the film. I mean, just seeing the impact. Of course, Jan was central in it as uh, Zach's mom because, you know, she was that one that initially had the, and she, you know, plays a pretty big role in the film is, is helping dad find his way, which was powerful. But you're surrounded by all these people. I mean, did you, did you ever, I mean, in the moment though, do you ever think about your downline ministry of how many people have just, I mean, that, that you've touched over the years for, for the you know, kingdom? It's, you know, if you, if, it's like that. Trying to remember, seeing them, and they tell me, "You remember me?" And, yeah. And I'm back, and I said, "How long have you been gone?" You know, because I was bothering them, you know. But they would say, "Oh, I remember back, you know, 32 years ago. I remember 25 years ago." 
they go back in time, but a lot of them, it, it, they never forget the story. Yeah. Well, I just so, thought, yeah, even the narration. It makes it cool, really. It makes me, you know, you, I said, who are you? He said, you don't remember me? I said, nah, you look. And then they tell me, you know, and I'm, too many. I th- It's always exciting when you, like when you see someone come to faith. Uh, uh, I'm 45 now, so I'm, I'm just now at this place in my walk with the Lord that, I'm seeing, I'm meeting people, someone that maybe I was involved in, and them, you know, knowing Jesus for the first time, and then seeing them do that. Like, I, I to me, like I, a life well lived is I want to sit back when I'm 76, and I want to. I hope there's generations of people that I had even like. It's coming. Yeah, it's coming. That that, that that's a life well lived. Well, in fact, yep. Lou, we give you a hard time. You know, we we always have. But I, I'm in a serious mode, I want to tell you, you did such a fantastic job putting it together because you basically took the story, and it's so much. I mean, it's more than just a movie, but to condense that into something we can grab and did a fantastic job. I love just the vehicle by which you told the story. I love movies that start somewhere and then show you what built to that point. That's kind of what you show do. you how, people, how it works. Uh, one dude came up one day in the last few years, and he said, Mr. Robinson, you remember the time that you broke out your belt and you gave us all a whipping? I said, no, why'd they give you a whipping? He said, well, you gave us a whipping because we, we, had, we had a big drunk fest that night and you got wind of it and the parents of one of the guys, old Billy Red Dog Phillips, his mom and them, said, you need to, you need to tear their little butts up. They were about 15. No, I Al, think they were older than that. No, <laughs> Al, Al was with them. We ranged from 15 to 18. Now. Al was with them and I was the one Red the Dog. One. But this guy was the one that I, I had to tell him. I said, son, I, I don't know who you are. I had my belt in my hand. Oh, Terry. He, he was they the, were going, getting in a line and putting three licks on everybody. So I said, I don't know who you are or where you came from, <laughs> but you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Bend over that car. <laughs> If your daddy don't like it, tell him to come see me. So I tore his butt up. He, he said, really did it, yeah. He said, Mr. Robinson, that's been 18 years, but I just want to tell you, I'm back. Oh, that's good. We should that's have, that's, that'll be in the sequel. Yeah, okay. that could be the sequel. Well, it's, I'll tell you something. The Reckoning. I'll tell you something cool. I had long forgotten him, but he was saying he, he didn't forget it. Well, we, hang, we, on, hang on before you tell that. Let's take another break. We had a couple, uh, so most everybody at the film that was there for the screening was either family or close friends who are part of the story. And again, we didn't get everybody there, but we did have a, a couple uh, extras, extras that we invited. Um, well, one was Tanya from Unashamed Nation attended uh, to represent kind yeah, of- Yeah, I finally got to meet Tanya. She's which amazing. Is, yeah, so she- so, I, met, I met her at WFR- as well, she came to to. Uh, oh, it was awesome! Yeah, like yeah. she said, uh, so I, so I saw her because I, I didn't see her at church that Sunday because we ended up doing a house church with some friends. But, um, but um, I met, I, I talked to her at the at the screening, and she said, you know, I've been praying for years to. I want, I wanted to go to church with my husband. We've never been to church together since they've been married. I don't know how long they've been married. And she, but she said today, yesterday. We, it was the first time that we'd ever worshiped together in a church at White Street Road. She said we went to Phil's class, and, really? and he's standing right there, like, "Yeah, it was awesome." Like, like so it's like it's those little moments that there's another group we invited because we had the contest, yep. you know, uh, which we talked about on here. Um, and the lady who won, her name is Kim. So she won the contest, but she had, so she had the tickets to come to the family screening. You know, we paid for all expenses, paid all that. And she couldn't go because she had already promised her her daughter who was going on a retreat that you know she's like no you're good. I, I, I'm gonna watch the kids and so she'd already made that commitment and so um, we were like well we, you know you want you want it so you at least get the money and I mean yeah. if you can't come you can't come and she's like it's like twenty five hundred bucks she's like no she said I want you to find somebody else who I do not want to take that seat I want someone who who needs somebody else needs to be at this movie. And and I'm I'm just going to give that money back and y'all. So we found this other couple who we picked, do another, do another met drawing. The, the yeah, couple. they told me that the couple met. Well, I took a picture with them. They yeah. wanted me to take a picture with them. That's what happened. That's how they got there. And then they needed to be there, and they were just in tears about it. And yeah, they were from West Virginia. Yeah, and yep. drove all the way over. Great, yep. great couple. Well, here's the crazy part. So then Kim, her 
uh, son and or her nephew got in a horrible car wreck, and so she was able like to be there for her family. And so I and, and now he's has actually has surgery. I think a ten hour surgery. So he's in his name's Scotty. So I thought I did want to. Uh, maybe get Phil to pray for Scotty just because I thought the story was so amazing that her giving up her seat and all that. And Which then, was so what a beautiful thing to do for someone else. And then, oh, well, you mean they got knocked out because of the car wreck? Well, they did no, she got knocked out for something else, but her her nephew got in a car wreck, and then now she's been ministering to the family. So, like, in God's timing, you know, he had her where he needed her to be. Wow, and so, um, I did want to pray for, for Scotty. I just want to see if you could say a prayer for Scotty in yeah. his surgery. Yeah, right now. Right now, Father, we do pray for Scotty. the The, the road to immortality is uh, straight and rather narrow. Mm. I bless his life, Father, and heal his body. Yep, we love you, and so does Scotty. In mm. the name of Jesus, Amen. 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 Thank you. So yeah, that was it. Was just cool to see how all this comes together. I mean, I keep thinking about the power of community, the power of <laughs> how God orchestrates things, and it's you see his sovereignty in moments like this in your life when you're looking back at it, and you're like, man, God was orchestrating a lot of things. You know, we were talking about these different individuals trying to remember their names and all, but it is pretty amazing on all the the the, the individuals who had contact with Jesus. A lot of times, he gives them their name. Their their names are written. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You, you wouldn't think, you know, right? It, it, it'd be worth recognizing them. But somehow, God thought it right, but prudent to go yeah. ahead and and t tell who they were, what they did, and add a little background to them, and then they talk about his conversion, his conversion. Right. Well, that's the same thing we're doing in modern day. Yeah, and that's the interesting thing about it to me is being able to sort of follow the fruit of that tree, which was to to sort of pivot. We're eventually going to get into Luke six today, which talks about a tree and its fruit. And, you know, I think that idea of that, that it is, I mean, all of us individually make a decision for Christ. And when we, when we started- Everybody has a story. Everybody does. When we started this book in Luke, and we and we linked it to Acts, because Luke wrote Luke and he wrote Acts, it, I always thought it was interesting, and we I don't know if we talked about this or not, but that he addressed it to a person. It was to Theophilus. I mean, he had a person in mind mm -hmm. that he was writing this to. And I don't know that I appreciate it as much as I have this week after watching the film that God wants a relationship with each and every one of us. And so it's yep. like you could take that, you know, dearest Theophilus and just draw a blank and put your name in there That's because it. it really is aimed to each one of us. But each one of us then becomes that tree that then blesses other people if if we do it the way God wants us. And the to. same sins they were battling with, if you if you fast forward to mid, mid, middle two thousand two thousand years, it's the same thing. It is. It, it, it's just it just just sin, and you know. And then he'll explain it. You know, the whoever the Matthew or Mark or Luke, they'll give you a little explanation of what was going on. Well, one of the settings, Dad, that or someone asked you how you felt about the movie. You read what Paul said to Timothy, who was yep. his disciple, about the kind of man he was when he oh, was Saul. Terrible. And then the man he became when he was Paul. He I mean, wrote a killer of, of gigantic proportions. And yet he winds up writing over half the New Testament. Yeah, amazing. So, well, there wasn't a lot of Christians back then, followers of Jesus, just because of population numbers, and it had just started. So you just think everywhere he went, yeah, he was bumping into people, family, yeah, uh, that. They were still getting over the fact that he killed their family members. Right, yeah, that's an interesting point. And didn't well, you didn't you yeah. say the same director that did our film did Paul the Apostle? He did, yeah. Which is really interesting I, when you said that. I have a shot because I thought about it that to Jace's point that in that movie the most powerful thing that spoke to me in that movie Paul the Apostle, which is very good by the way, I highly recommend it, was that he was having all these images in his mind of all the people that he had tortured and killed. Yep. And so like his whole life of ministry, he couldn't let that in the film. He couldn't. You, you wonder if that was his thorn in the flesh, if it was it could it, have been. the guilt and shame from what he did. He said he was right. the worst, so who am I to argue with you? And then the idea was when he finally stretched his neck out on that post yep. to give his life in the film, well, I hate to give it away, but you know how it ends anyway. You know, he is reunited with all those people in eternity that he helped put there. 
Yeah. You know, I mean, that's a powerful, <laughs> you talk about fruit of a tree, you know. That's, that's, that, yeah, that's divine fruit. You, I, I, yeah. That's a good point, Jason. But you think about the Paul, more than likely, you know, what he did, he did, he ran into the same people that he persecuted to the point where it was, yeah. like, I mean, he's. It had to have happened all the time. And think about, the, from their perspective, they're having to work through this. Yeah, barrier like like you killed my what like you were there at the stoning of Stephen like like, like yeah. what and then now you're up bitter and I mean it's just it it, it was it I mean, there to... just wasn't a lot of Christians just I mean we we look at a few like, thousand. there was three thousand but I mean overall it was very few and everybody knew a, the leadership just right. as a, a, a if a truth comes out of all this I mean why would you think he would the one to write most of the new test testament he would pick this kind of person yeah he, i mean well that's the it thing knocks man. out anybody <laughs> saying well you know you say I, I know i'm bad i don't know whether they ever come back i said oh no the one that's writing all about this he's worse than you if you just get right down to it i mean but it is interesting that he picked somebody who was a blasphemer like he said you know and a killer well and and you could run that out however you wanted to let's let's take another break You can run that out however you want to, but there's a lot of different reasons why. One is that I've always thought is because the people that Jesus encircled himself with, we know were consider themselves and others consider them unschooled and ordinary men. Paul was a very schooled and extraordinary man. Yeah. So Great he was mind. completely different than the original group, and yet he bore the burden of having been he against kinda it. He kind of mentioned that it's because of my ignorance. Right. Uh, one of the things that that God looked at was just, you know, how ignorant can you be? So if you think about it, like all the rejection of Pharisees that we read about in the Gospels, Paul was a Pharisee that came on board. Yeah. But only out of being struck down by his own weight and guilt. So, you know, it's it's pretty powerful. There's a lot of different reasons why, I suppose. But even in Luke, you know, 5, you had the this moment with the leper, and then you have this moment with the paralytic, then you have the moment with the tax collector. Well, when we get to chapter 7, which we're in between there, Here's a guy who's commanding. I call it the Untouchables Part Two, Jase. It's, uh, the, it's the sequel. A Roman uh, soldier, his servant. Yeah. So it's a double well, whammy. But he's the Roman. He had you the know, faith. That's yeah, right. Yeah, it's coming, and uh, and then you then you have the a town prostitute. Yep. It just you're like, what, 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 who, why is he going after this diverse? <laughs> Of people, and he seems to be having the most difficult with the religious leaders, and so it's just not what most people think of when they think of uh, Christianity. Right, yeah. and so it's that's why I think reading the not many the would Gospels, volunteer to say they were the worst, only a handful, but a lot of them do say I'm beyond help because I'm so sorry. And they, then they line out what they've been doing. You know, yeah. I'm not worth it. Well. God says, yeah, you're worth it. Well, and Luke in particular highlights these undesirables, untouchables. He, There's no doubt him coming at it with a Greek perspective, he broadens it. Because Matthew yep. was very narrow in the fulfillment of the law, fulfillment of prophecy. Mark had this abridged version, very short gospel. John gives you basically the last week of Jesus you know, and, and it's a very personal nature. Luke broadens this whole thing. He's yep. like, it's for everybody, yep. you know, and which is which is really fantastic, I think, to your point, Jay. Well, and that's why when he gave his version of the Sermon on the Mount, which is not, nothing was changed. He just, he just made you think, based on what he had heard from Jesus, more in what, what defines success. You know, you have the worldly kingdom. He just looked at it from a kingdom perspective. And, and you don't really know how much instruction was in the, after he struck him down blind, he's staggering around down there. The, the you coast. talking about Paul? Yeah. Yeah. And he's fumbling around down in there. So it doesn't tell you exactly, but I think that he was going on, undergoing some, uh, what would you well, call he it? he spent days with Ananias. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there was some intense I do too. instruction. Yeah. But you, you got to remember, he was sincerely mistaken, which which kind of what we're getting in today, today, what's going on in your heart and your belief system, you know, matters. And so it's just not as clear, 
even in the world, everybody tends to justify their behavior and lifestyle and what, what they're doing. And so uh, when you encounter Jesus and are introduced to him, that you've got to be open-minded and soft-hearted enough to even consider something different. I think that's what he's going to get so, into. So I want to say this, Chase, as we, as we kind of reset to get to this text today, which you're going to be in Luke 6, 43, if you're following along, is you, you made this point, it was good, and it's been a minute, I don't remember what podcast it was back, when we were talking about this idea about the hypocrite and having the plank in your eye and seeing the speck in the other eye. And you yeah. made a good point I hadn't thought about before, because I kind of like most people kind of focused on this hyperbolic way Jesus describes, and it's almost humorous. But there was a really good underlying point you made about being able to see because if you've got a plank in your eye, you can't see. Can't see. And it, yeah. and it took me back. We were talking about Saul a minute ago. It was ironic that when, when Jesus made himself known to Saul and revealed himself, he he blinded him at the same time. He physically blinded he, he put such a bright light on Saul that he physically blinded him. He couldn't see anything. So some sort of massive. He was literally crawling around on the ground. He was, and he couldn't see, and so they had to lead him into this city. And so all of a sudden, this guy who was, all of his helpers probably just were over there looking like good night. Well, they just they didn't even know what happened. Yeah. They were just kind of stunned by the whole thing. So they lead him into this city where ultimately he humbles himself and he gives himself to Christ, and then these scales fall off. And he can see, but it's pretty evident from little clues we get in the, his writings that he couldn't see very well. So he could see, but he couldn't see like he could before. But now he saw clearly yeah. because he saw Christ. And so I think it was interesting that this text leads us into that, Jace, because he, he well, Jesus leads that by saying, unless you can see clearly yeah. me, you're not be able to see what, what how important this life is. So Well, just to read it again. So this was 641, because I do think understanding this is going to open our eyes to what he's going to say next. But he says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? Pay no pay no attention to the plank in your own eye, which I made a point. That word for plank, it, it was as big, it was a beam. Like where think, the whole, think a railroad tie. Yeah, yeah. telephone pole yeah. or, you know, something. So, you know, before we read that, now most people have always viewed this as he was trying to be humorous, but but I don't. I just think, because there's millions of more wood particles in this beam than there is would be a speck. So what's his, what's his point? I think he's saying you can't see that you have this enormous problem. You're, you're not looking at others from a viewpoint of you have the same enormous problem, which is called sin. Right. And when you forget that, you tend to be judgmental have a judgmental spirit, which he he just got through talking about. Do not judge, or you will be judged. The, yeah, so the, you plank, say, the plank thing was an illustration of that thought. Well, think about it. If you just peel all this back and think about real life on what Jesus is addressing, we all are into image management. We want people to see the best version of ourselves. That's why social media took off. It's right. the perfect place to you for you to through airbrushing and through Filters, selective yeah. messaging to give the best best version of yourself. That's why when people can type something, they're way more confident and bold, and because yeah. they're just it's all an image. But in that same spirit, those same people are devastated when you criticize them. Yeah. So it's like two, there's two sides of this. And you're like, well, why? Because they can't see that they have the same problem. Correct. I mean, you're over there trying to peel a speck out of somebody's eye, saying, let me help you out here. And you're coming across like you don't have these problems. Yeah. And that's I'm why. I'm bad. He, I'm bad, but I'm better than you. Exactly. <laughs> so that's why he said, you hypocrite, because it's, it's so weird. You know, the Greek word for hypocrite, you know how everybody does that, is hypocrite. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's the same word in English, which is very unusual. And, uh, but these, and the same word that's also used in that is, is what we use for what we call acting. But, you know, back in their day, when they did a play or whatever, they would wear a mask. Right. Well, so you see why he's using this word because, well, what do people do when they act? They're playing a part yeah. that that's not representing their heart. And, yeah. and if it's good acting, you're like, man, I mean, how can they do? You know, yeah. this is incredible. <laughs> 
Well, it's we're like, actually like, all actors in a way. It's like people with a British accent that sound like fail. You know, yeah. it's just it's hard to imagine that happen. Let's take our last break. But I think the key point he's addressing here is you're lying to yourself. And because all this other was how you treat people, and then all of a sudden he he gets into this and to continue reading and in forty two he says, How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? And that's why I said it, it's a more he's going into what's going on in your heart, in yeah. your perspective. And and we all act like we don't know what this is, and we think he's being funny. No, he he's he's, he's getting saying to, he's getting to the core of it. Yeah, let's take the mask off and be yeah. real here. You're going around pointing fingers at everybody, and you're not doing it from a place that you realize this enormous, huge problem that you have. So then he says, "You hypocrite! First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye." So when I think you take this further with a focus on Jesus and a realization of your own sin, you say, what does this mean, seeing the plank clearly? Well, when you get to Jesus and realize, you know, he knows what's in a man. You know, the the last verse in John 2 says that he didn't trust the people because he knew what was in their heart. (laughs) He he knew what was in a man is what the NIV says. It's a a very unusual verse. When you think about it and you look at this through Jesus' eyes, well, this big plank that we're ignoring, that's what he died on. Yeah. That, that's the uh, illustration. He, he died on our planks that, are, that we can't see, which yeah. is basically our own sin. And so you see the innocent sacrifice that he did that becomes personal and on a wooden beam yeah, that what you died made cross yeah. ways. It's your sin. You created this problem that you're in denial about and making yourself feel better through smoke and mirrors by either judging others or lashing out when someone criticizes you. And so that's what really causes humility is to realize this enormous sin problem that we all have, which made has me think to be of, recognized. Which made me think about Hebrews 12 when he says, "Keep your eyes focused on me." Yeah, because he went to the cross, not scorning it. Shame. The idea that I took that yeah. shame for you. So as long as you stay focused on me, well, I, I think that's the big transition here. Is he's because we want to make it the battle is us versus them, right? And what he said, no, no, the battle is us versus him. Yeah, that's and great and when we see that battle as as us versus him, then when you see that who you're up against and who you've been rebelling against, it is the great leveler. Right. I mean, it's the, and we were talking about this the other day, and uh, we were talking about having kids in church, and, and they're, oh, well, they're not, they're not, we didn't send them out the Bible hour or whatever. We're like, well, no, we, we think they need to be there with us. We're like, well, they're not really getting it. And we're like, well, are we really getting it? I mean, the chasm between what I get about God and what my, what my two year old gets about God is there's, there's not really that big of a difference right. if he's that high. So I think it's, well, you go from us versus them to us versus him, and then I realize who I'm up against. Man, that puts me in a posture of uh, it, it brings me to my knees, which is what happened to the apostle Paul when he was saw on the road to Damascus. He saw the the risen Jesus. He fell at his face as though he was dead. He was blinded. And the same thing happened to John on the Isle of Patmos. He saw the risen Lord. By the way, he said it was like looking at the sun and all of its radiance. So That's I right. think there's this idea when we see when we look at who Jesus, we look at the person of Jesus, and then I think, how do I stack up next to this guy? And what is my proximity and relationship and, and my posture and heart towards him? Nobody can say, yeah, I think I'm good. No, yeah. Nobody yeah. can say that. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. Well, it was a good point you brought up about the kids because the kids, I've always thought, are the greatest hypocrite detectors in the world. Yeah. yeah. Because they see us tell them, no, you can't do that. How dare you? And then they see us. <laughs> do it. Well, why are you doing that? Like, well, wasn't that technically a lie, Dad, when you were on the phone? I mean, you told me not to lie. <laughs> Sound like to me. Oh, call you and you're out. like, huh, uh, yeah. <laughs> go, 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 go play. Go, well, go outside. And, they, and that's why, you know, really, you, you, there is a lot you have to apologize for, you know, when they grow up. Yeah. Because they, they see you 24-7 and they see your hypocritical moments right. that you think, Nobody Nobody's sees because it's all about image management. And uh, so it's a good, it's a really good point. But I wanted to read James 1 because I think it's incredible based on what we just read about this plank system. 
I mean, you see James basically make the same point in verse 22 when it says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. You know, deceiving yourself is part of the acting. What is, yeah, it is what is being addressed by Jesus and James here. It says, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So the hypocrite, which we all have hypocritical tendencies, let's face it, let's be honest. Sure. We don't like mirrors, mm. especially for a spiritual mirror. It's way easier not to look at the mirror and look at someone else and say, well, I don't, you know, to use this to his analogy as in like, well, you know, they're getting old or they don't look as good. And because well, what's so fascinating about it is the most beautiful people really on the planet hate the mirrors the most. Yeah, because they always are finding some, in just the nature of being a human, you're there's always someone better looking. We get old, we <laughs> we gain weight, we. But when you do this in the spiritual, you see the same principles. It's it's so much easier to throw rocks at other people because why? Well, it makes you feel better. Yeah, you're like, look at me. So watch what he says. Uh, but the man, verse twenty five, who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. And so then he gives some practical illustrations. If anyone considers himself religious, yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself, and his religion is worthless. And then this famous verse about religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Great so the whole, advice. So the whole point is this deceit that goes on in your mind, and Jesus uses a fantastical illustration about removing the speck out of someone's eye, which, look, is not easy to do because it takes courage. I get squeamish. Now, Phil came from the old, get, come here, let me... Let me cut the top of the mountain off, you know, yeah, right. uh, getting the hook out of your hand. But to do it with love, from a perspective of, look, we're all a sinner, you realize that there's some gentleness, and but we need to speak the truth yeah. in love. And we need to be able... You know pain you know, is involved. You try to lessen it. But yeah. You know pain is involved with healing, which is a big part of this. Yeah. Um, so we're out of time. Uh, but in overtime, I just I, I wrote down here, Jess, I got a great mirror story. Uh, I love that text. I hadn't thought about this one until you brought that text up in James, but I want to tell a mirror story uh, that's so reflective of what you just described. So we'll do that in overtime, set a little bit more of this uh, Luke 6 up until next time on Unashamed. If you want to follow us over, it's blazetv.com slash unashamed for our bonus content. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.